Welcome to 7.30. Later in the programme, we'll bring you extraordinary scenes from the earthquake zone in Turkey, but first to Canberra. Just over 10 years ago, during the political crisis over asylum seekers, Labour introduced a sudden policy change aimed at stopping those arriving by boat from securing refugee status and eventually citizenship. In the decades since, thousands of people have been in limbo, including some who arrived as children. The Albanese government pledged to deal with the 30,000 so-called legacy cases, but many still have no idea what their future holds. Chief political correspondent Laura Tingle reports. Support for Labour has slumped, driven by a large shift away from the party by mail voters. Kevin Rudd has no policies in this area. Other than to put out the welcome mat for people smugglers. Back in 2013, Kevin Rudd had reclaimed the Labour leadership that had been snatched away from him just three years before. With an election looming, he was facing intense pressure to tackle a surge in boat arrivals of asylum seekers and ramped up his language on people smugglers and closed the door on people arriving by boat seeking asylum in Australia. The full page advertisements and the weekend press deliver the new message. The rules have now changed. From now on, any asylum seeker who arrives in Australia by boat will have no chance of being settled in Australia as refugees. That very same day, nine-year-old Saha Gassimi, along with her mother Zara, father Mehdi, and her four-year-old sister, arrived at Christmas Island after a miserable and terrifying trip by boat from Indonesia. I came to Australia on the 19th of July 2013. I am a number in the books, you know, I'm TIB 12. I'm defined as my boat number and I want that to stop because I'm more than just my boat number. Saha Gassimi is one of approximately 12,000 people who didn't benefit from yesterday's decision by the Albanese government to give people on temporary protection visas and safe haven enterprise visas a pathway to permanent residency in Australia. That's because she and her immediate family were sent to Nauru. Other members of her family who arrived the same day and on the same boat were kept in Australia and will now receive permanent residency. What I've been told by immigration, or what my family has been told by immigration, is that we are not eligible, we cannot apply for a different type of visa unless the minister it's himself decides that he wants to give us a different visa. Saha Gassimi's story shows the arbitrary nature of Australia's asylum seeker policy and its impact on people's lives. For the 19,000 who did benefit from yesterday's decision, they can now become permanent residents, even citizens with a chance to work and study, get access to government services like Medicare, sponsor family members, as well as travel to and from Australia. Australia's Operation Sovereign Borders policy architecture remains unchanged. But quite a few people have been left in limbo. And in the political world, not everyone is happy. Today is the day that the Labor government has dismantled Operation Sovereign Borders. They have put our border policy at risk. It's this sort of language from the coalition that has prompted the federal government to be careful in its language and careful in the way it announced its policy change yesterday. For example, there were no press conferences by government ministers to announce and explain the change. Instead, ministers have been at pains in the past week to emphasise there is no difference in policy between the major parties. I would point out that regional processing has been settled policy on both sides of politics for over a decade. But after more than a decade of asylum seeker policy being highly weaponised, last year's federal election produced new voices in the political debate. I was really surprised during my election campaign how many people raised refugee issues with me and said that that was really core to their beliefs about why they wanted a change of government. The customs boats conduct a grim patrol. In her former life as an ABC reporter, Zoe Daniel saw the drama of asylum seekers arriving by boat in Australia 10 years ago firsthand. It's at this very spot that so many people drowned just a few days ago. I've talked to people who've sat there for years in an imaginary queue, just hoping someone would give them a home. Some on the crossbench grudgingly concede that the current policies of boat turnbacks and offshore detention have to stay in place, but can be improved and that longer-term solutions have to be negotiated with countries in the region. 
Others argue there is now a mood among voters for broader change. The crossbench, I believe, is building the social licence to move this policy. The fact that the fate of around 12,000 people who came here by boat up to 2013 do not benefit from yesterday's announcement illustrates the inconsistencies in the policy, whether or not you agree with it. There are the 11,000 people who arrived and stayed in Australia but have not received temporary protection visas. Many of that group of people were assessed under the previous government's fast track process, which was a flawed process which didn't provide for natural justice and procedural fairness. And many of them are now appealing a refusal under that flawed process in the legal system. And we want some clarity around what will happen to those people. And then there's the question of what happens to around 1,100 people brought back to Australia from offshore detention. Being sent to Manus Island or Nauru also meant being put on bridging visas, which give them no right to settle in Australia. Sahar Ghasimi and her family were among them. There was no logical basis for why people were separated. It literally was, where were you standing in the queue? Sahar and her family spent five years on the island. Five years being in a place where it's designed to dehumanise you, where it's designed to mentally break you, you you can't take it anymore. So me and my sister both we were suffering from severe mental health and both me and my sister tried to commit suicide, which was the main reason we were transferred to Australia. The people sent to Manus Island and Nauru remained largely invisible to the Australian public, though some found a way to speak, including Kurdish-Iranian Behrouz Bachani, who wrote a book of his horrific experiences on his mobile phone. He's surreal to be here. Last week, he visited federal parliament and noted the impact on public opinion of asylum seekers having names and faces. Prime Minister took photo with Biwela family and with some other refugees. And just to send this message to Australian people that something changed. But actually, in my perspective, nothing changed. Saha's family were eventually moved to community detention in Sydney and to bridging visas, which allow them to work and pay taxes, but little else. Saha began school at year nine. She saw school as a path out and dreamed of being a lawyer. When I was in camera, I was like, you know what, they're talking about lawyers helping us, like someone's going to help us, but like no one really did. So, you know, I decided, I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be that one person that helps someone like me because no one helped me as a kid. Four years after starting formal schooling, Saha sat for her HSC and won a scholarship to study law at the University of Newcastle. So I did my HSC, went into uni in February and um, in April, was that's when my visa was due. And um, with the new visa, they, take away, they took away my study rights. I'm not allowed to do any form of education. I can't do TAFE, I can't do a three-day course for traffic controlling, I can't do any form of study. I mean, how can that happen? To get there, to achieve in the HSC, to have your community fundraise for you to send you to uni, to get a scholarship, to only then have it taken away from you? How, how cruel is that? Around 150 people remain in either Port Moresby, housed in a hotel on the outskirts of the town, or on Nauru. So they are still um, in really, really difficult circumstances and having exiled them there a decade ago in the first place, Labor has a moral obligation, not just to bring them here in line with our obligations under the Refugee Convention, but to find them a durable, permanent resettlement option. The Greens are proposing legislation that mirrors earlier Medivac laws, which saw many ill asylum seekers move to Australia. And it's been designed to specifically sit within Labor's policy framework. Labor supported the Greens Medivac amendment when they were in opposition, and this legislation is very similar to the Medivac legislation. For now, the government will be nervously waiting to gauge the political reaction to its move. In a time of major skill shortages, the spectre of a policy that seeks to get bright young people who want to learn and work to leave the country only seems more perplexing. My family was down for moving to America, no problem, you know. At least we can get out of camp. We came to Australia, we built a home here out of nothing. I can't start from zero again.
And if that story has raised any issues for you, you can call Lifeline on 13 11 14 or Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36.